Well, um, this week the Buena Vista mobile home park owners sued the city and there was a meeting for the public safety building that's been proposed for California Avenue that met with some public comment for the first time. Um, so this, uh, this first issue we'll talk about is Buena Vista. Um, the words oppressive, unreasonable, and unconstitutional were in the lawsuit filed by the Gisser family against the city of Palo Alto. Um, Gennady, why are they so... Um, up in arms. Let's not forget extortion and shakedown. Oh, th those are part of the press release, but uh, <laughs> same type of thing. Um, so uh, this is not really surprising. As, as to answer why, uh, this is kind of a reiteration in stronger terms of an argument that the Gister's um, attorney has been making throughout the hearings, which is that the city is requiring these kinds of onerous conditions on the Gister family um, just because they want to exercise their right to no longer be landlords at Buena Vista. So we, so it, it's not that surprising that this legal, um, that this suit was filed this week um, in the U.S. federal court. But uh, it is notable that there's a new player now in, in this fight, the Pacific Legal Foundation, uh, which is, kind of takes it to a new level. Um, and uh, who, who, are the, who is the Pacific Legal Foundation? It's a conservative libertarian nonprofit that's kind of been representing clients um, since, since the mid-70s on issues mostly relating to property rights. Mm -hmm. They've had some notable victories lately. Um, they're, they're participating in a current suit against San Jose um, uh, over its recent um, inclusion ordinance, which requires developers to kind of include affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And they were also representing a, a, a homeowner um, last year in San Francisco, and they actually succeeded, which was a somewhat similar situation to this one where the owner was contesting the fact that the relocation assistance um, mm -hmm. is too high and uh, constitutes a taking. Was this a mobile home park uh, situation in San Francisco, or was this in a, a rental? That, that was not. That was, more, that was more of a rent issue and uh, yeah. the Ellis Act issue. Yeah. Yeah. So it's similar, but not exactly the same. But philosophically, you get to see the same kinds yeah. of wards pop up. Yeah, it's interesting that this was filed in the U.S. District Court. Um, not at county um, level. So this foundation seems like it's aiming for, um, and, and cites actually, the U.S. Constitution, it's looking at, at a federal level. And some of the um, allegations are that this violates the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments mm -hmm. in um, private property taken for public use, as well as California state law and exceeding reasonable costs uh, for relocation of the park's tenants. Um, mm -hmm. It also has a dispute with just the um, fact that the city is uh, asking for relocation assistance um, be, in part because, or the, the arguments made that um, this is affordable housing um, and the city needs to be providing affordable housing. And just as you're saying that it's not our responsibility alone to bear this public responsibility. Yes, and, and they've made the same um, argument in other cases as well that uh, this is kind of forcing one private property owner to uh, bear the cost of solving a problem that should be spread, uh, the cost should be spread to, you know, throughout the wider public. But to your greater point about the, the fact that it's in federal court, I think it's kind of a big deal because uh, this is very different from the lawsuit that the Buena Vista tenants filed in August, which is, uh, has more to do with the process of the hearings, that, that the residents have like a, you know, a, a, a fair hearing at, at the during during the hearings, and also um, that will pertain more to kind of like the actual relocation package. Where mm -hmm. was the city's ordinance closely followed? This one kind of looks at the U.S. Constitution. It's kind of much broader strokes. So I think if the decision comes out here, it might have broader implications as well. I mean, as you mentioned, Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment are kind of like the, the bedrocks of this. Uh, but I have a question. Didn't mm -hmm. didn't just sort of sign uh, when the, I thought I saw something in the ordinance some time ago where there's actually, the Gisters actually signed an agreement to this. So if that's the case, then haven't they waived their rights to these kinds of arguments? So signed the agreement to what? I thought what they, they had signed something related to the ordinance. I saw their signature on it. Well, they, they agreed with the city back in 2001 when right. the ordinance was instituted. Right. And, I, and I think it's also kind of interesting, this relocation package that they're challenging now, they, they themselves proposed it. That, there uh, you go. So it's like, and, uh, 
in a sense, they didn't really have a choice. Like the city's ordinance prescribes what the assistance package should have, so they kind of followed that uh, pretty strictly. And so, but and right now, so the, throughout the hearings, they're basically saying, if you let us close it, we're going to provide these things. And now that it's been approved, they're basically saying this list of things we're going to provide is unconstitutional to require us to do that. But that was something, I mean, maybe it's a matter of legal timing, but there are, you know, the things that are always bannered around in, in court cases, early on in court cases, there are things like waiver and estoppel. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, you know, it, it, it pertains to, you basically knew that the situation, what the situation was, and you didn't do anything about it in a timely manner, so therefore, you know, that's it. So I don't know whether or not that will be something that will come up. It, I'm sure it will, it will sure be waived in the court. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a non-lawyer, yeah. I was totally waiting for you to ask me some waiver and a stop <laughs> and, um, <laughs> questions. But I'd be surprised if this uh, kind of if this applies in this case because I feel like the city's been kind of expecting this. I mean, there's a reason why during the process everybody was super cautious because there, there's, there's been an expectation that both sides are going to take some legal actions. Right. Each each now has a foundation on the opposite sides of the kind of ideological spectrum representing it. So, um, and the attorney herself, uh, Margaret Nanda, before this, the Pacific Legal Foundation was hired, throughout the hearings kind of in, implied to that effect that, um, you know, that the justices are being kind of, you know, unfairly targeted by by everybody, the city, the media, everybody that they're the victims here, and um, so uh, I don't think anybody has ever s signed any letter saying we're not going to sue. I yeah. think there's a couple of interesting things about this development. One is that um, both of the law firms that are on representing both sides of this, um, they're not charging legal fees. So mm -hmm. in a typical civil litigation matter, you have finances driving the process. It's, mm -hmm. it's really financially a huge burden on a plaintiff or a defendant, and there is strong motivation to reach an agreement, a settlement. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, that those, those normal incentives have gone away. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that's really interested, interesting about the Pacific Legal Foundation's entry is that they're not particularly interested in settlement Mm -hmm. um, and what, what they have a political mission, right. um, and they're interested in precedent, in establishing legal precedent. And so their involvement um, is either an incredibly smart strategic move because it's going to make people assume one thing and maybe it's another, but I think basically their involvement signals a long time for this to get worked out. And, and as a result, it would suggest to me at least that there's not going to be any change in the status at Buena Vista for possibly years mm -hmm. unless the, the possibility of selling the park just becomes too attractive for everybody. No, I, I agree with you, and I think if there is a silver lining for the residents out of the fact that the owner is now suing mm -hmm. the city, there's this one line in the complaint that was filed this week uh, basically says, the Jisser family has refrained from taking any actions to close their mobile home park as permitted under the city's approval because they do not want to make payments to tenants that are unconstitutionally and unreasonably demanded in violation of California law and the U.S. Constitution. So what this says, after the, the city approved the closure, they could have the following month to begin their eviction process. Um, they haven't done that, and there was kind of like this period of anxiety, like, mm -hmm. you know, what are the justices going to do next? And here they're basically saying that while we're in dispute over this, we, we don't plan on kind of evicting people because that means we'd have to pay out these costs as part of the relocation law, and we think they're illegal. So the silver lining is, for a while at least, the residents will, will get to stay put in their locations while this is being sorted out. So, Does, yeah. Do the justices have a um, time period by which they must begin eviction proceedings under the ordinance? I don't believe so. I think they may have, but I think that the, um, there was some agreement. Uh, um, they did have negotiations w w with the city to kind of to waive some clause or other. I, I don't know the specifics. Waive the statute of limitations. Yeah, so that basically they can. Yeah, it was it was done for the purpose to kind of enable negotiations over the city and the county and Caritas kind of forming an agreement with the justice to sell Buena Vista. They, they, they didn't want those timelines to influence that, but. Um, well, it certainly suggests no urgency on the judiciary's part to get this resolved if they brought in the Pacific Legal Foundation. Yeah, it sounds like they're in here for the long haul. Yeah, yeah the tension's been going on in this case for, um, well, ever since 2012, which is when the judiciary announced that they wanted to um, close the park. But there was a, a glimmer of hope 
kind of in the early summer, uh, and you just mentioned the uh, Caritas Corporation, uh, the Santa Clara County, um, the city all put money in, um, sorry, the county and the city put money in um, to possibly purchase uh, the mobile home park for the Gissers. And now it just completely devolved, um, partly because of the statute of limitations that the residents were facing in filing their lawsuit in August, and now this, um, this lawsuit as well. Well, so, there are some optimists who would say that hasn't completely devolved. I mean, Joseph Median being among them, he's basically saying uh, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a slowdown, it's a temporary kind of thing because of the mm -hmm. residents' lawsuit, but mm -hmm. um, hopefully the negotiations get back on track. It's, it's never been a sure thing. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's a little bit of a game of chess right now uh, because now both sides have lawsuits Mm -hmm. um, against the city of Palo Alto. The city of Palo Alto is going to begin incurring major legal fees. They're going to have to appear in both federal court and state court on mm -hmm. these two different cases. Um, and so uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's clear that this really affects the possible sale of the property. It may just create sort of pressure on both sides to consider um, selling. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another question, too, about Gissers as well. Could this also just be a move to perhaps try to pressure the city into perhaps taking on the load of um, uh, the relocation fees for the, for the, uh, for the tenants in, in, instead? Like maybe the city's already come up with what, clo uh, city and county come up with, what, close to $30 million? Mm -hmm. Could they maybe come up with another $8 million to then take that uh, load off of Gissers? Um, I mean, I'd be surprised. I haven't heard like, anybody kind of argue to that effect, and I don't see. Uh, I, I can't imagine like the city basically giving the donating eight million dollars uh, for the gisters to help comply with what they believe is to be a city ordinance. It's, it would be kind and of. And it sort of runs counter it, to the, the city's purpose. stated strategy, which is yeah. to retain the mobile home park. So I think that that sort of a strategy is unlikely. I think that the. the the odd thing is the involvement of the Pacific Legal Foundation, right. given they don't get involved just to have a conflict resolved, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what most mm -hmm. law firms are, in, are, are focused on, is, is compromise. Yeah, yeah, and this lawsuit, I mean, it doesn't mention anything about any monetary um, request. They're not saying we don't want to pay at all. It's really much more of a philosophical mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. situation, isn't it? Yeah, they're basically... Uh, they're not, they're not asking the city for money, but they're asking the city to waive the requirements that they provide this relocation assistance. And yeah, it, it is obviously grounded. When you start, like, when you, the U.S. Constitution is kind of like your basis, you're pretty committed to it. I mean, yeah. uh, you, don't, you don't use words like extortion and shakedown unless you're kind of feel pretty strongly that, you know, the laws are being violated. But, um, yeah. but I, I do think kind of to return to your, um, your prior point about uh, the sale kind of devolving, uh, e even though, as I mentioned, there's some optimism kind of lessening that mm -hmm. it still might happen, uh, I, I do think it's kind of significant that the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, which is representing the residents, their confidence level seems to have fallen after this lo new lawsuit came out. Uh, they put out a statement yesterday basically saying that uh, in light of the lawsuit, the Residents Association, I mean, they're going to explore, uh, you know, the response to this, but they're saying uh, the owner's suit seems to put the possibility of resolving this matter out of court disappointingly out of reach, well, right. it's going to be in court, mm -hmm. but um, but it, it seems like this kind of effort to purchase it from the Gissers, is, uh, they don't mm -hmm. think it's going to, they don't think it's as likely as it once was. Mm -hmm. Although at this point, any statement made by a lawyer in this matter is positioning. Right. So Kind of like a game of chicken. Yeah. Who's going to back down yeah. first? Yeah. What, um, so I was reading some of the Town Square uh, reactions to the Gissers lawsuit, and I think one of the interesting points um, that was brought out was um, that we often refer to um, the tenants leaving the property as either displacement or eviction and um, kind of frame it as property rights versus uh, compassion, I guess. Um, I don't say that with any sarcasm whatsoever, but, you know, just uh, typifying each side. Um, so some of the people on Town Square were saying, well, this is property rights versus property rights because um, unlike a rent control situation with an apartment, you don't own the apartment, but you do own the mobile home. So there has to be, mm -hmm. uh, according to state law, some uh, compensation for the investment that you put into your mobile home that's not really that mobile um, mm -hmm. and having to find some, uh, some housing elsewhere. And it's interesting that the uh, residents, from their standpoint, 
uh, the phrase comparable housing in the 2001 uh, mobile home ordinance for the city. That was really bandied about as to what is comparable housing. Mm -hmm. And in Silicon Valley, with rising real estate prices, is it possible anywhere to get comparable housing? Or does comparable housing encompass you know, educational opportunities, transportation opportunities, health, business you know, opportunities, and, and such? So while the, um, while the legal foundation, uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation is going at it from a constitutional standpoint, um, the, the uh, residence attorneys are talking about kind of the broader, the broader compensation package. And, and I think they even said that it's inadequate. Um, the oh, yeah. six to eight million dollars um, that might be um, paid to the tenants if relocation were Which to is the forward. reason for their suit against yeah. the city. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the residence attorneys are basically saying that um, the relocation assistance package is way too meager, mm -hmm. and then the judges are saying it's way too huge. Uh, and um, and the, the residence attorneys are basically saying, it, it does go back to this comparable argument. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, you're basically, they're basically saying, the relocation um, that's, that's being proposed and, and has been approved is basically going to require all the residents to go elsewhere anyway. They're going to be displaced. They can't live here. Mm -hmm. But then the other side is saying uh, that may be the case, but it's not a problem that our client has created and mm -hmm. you shouldn't be burdened by footing the cost. So yeah. I thought that was really interesting, too, an interesting point that they brought up in the lawsuit, um, the Gissers lawsuit, and mm -hmm. that is that the city has not, the city has failed to provide the uh, kind of affordable housing that they seem to be putting on to the Gissers to afford, to provide. Well, it's one of the things that unites the two sides, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from their, their decision to sue the city, they're also united by the fact that, um, uh, like, the, the residents' attorneys are saying that the city failed to kind of comply with the uh, Fair Housing Act and with its own housing element by not doing more to support Buena Vista. Right. They're going to lose this huge source of housing. And, uh, you know, the Gissers' attorney is saying that the city helped create this problem where there's a huge housing shortage. So everybody kind of agrees on that part. And then right. they're kind of requiring Gissers to. The irony of that is what does he think has caused the, the value of his land to go up so high? You <laughs> exactly. Know I mean? You exactly. just really can't. That's going to be a tough argument. Yeah, and, and I certainly don't buy the fact that the city council alone caused this properties to kind of go up. I think... The weather and Stanford and technology and the job opportunities, there's yeah. a lot of things that kind of go into this, but, yeah. so, but, yeah. but that's what they're saying. Yeah. Well, the arguments kind of chase each other around in <laughs> circles in, in this issue. So City Attorney Molly Stump says that the city will be responding sometime early next year. Is that where this goes next? Yeah, I mean, this just came in on Thursday, so they're formulating the response. But she, she basically reasserted the fact that um, she believes, you know, the city has been following everything to the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. And so... The, yeah, and, and the fact that we're being goes. sued by both sides is just proof of that, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> if I wouldn't read anything into right. that. Yeah. <laughs> the okay. council certainly is going to take some heat on having put the position, mm. the city in the position of being vulnerable to two, mm -hmm. to both sides suing. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we certainly haven't seen the end of the political arguments about this. We've yeah. already seen a lot of that response on Town Square as yeah. well. The readers are, are already saying that. And yeah. in, in the council's defense, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they would face heat from both sides no matter what decision <laughs> they reached. I mean, it's just a really tough situation right. with two really strong arguments. You know, yeah. liberty on one side, compassion on the other. And it's like, how do you balance the two? And, uh, you know, whichever way they, they would have chosen. I mean, had they decided not to approve it, it's like... They still would have been super both sides. So. Yeah. Well, the question is whether it's this council that everyone should be mad at or the 2001 council that came right. up with the mobile mm -hmm. home ordinance in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and and did, did their you know, definitions uh, give enough clarity to um, relocation compensation, or could that have been sharpened in any, mm -hmm. in any way? Good point. Yeah. Well, moving on to a different topic of the proposed public safety building. It has, in some sense, landed in the California Avenue area after being proposed for different places. There was a community meeting this week for people to take a look at the plans. Only 20 people showed up. Do you think that's, you know, what do you make of that turnout? Um, it's hard to say because whenever I go to any community meetings, I have to say that they're not really necessarily well attended, mm -hmm. except where, where people really feel that they're in imminent danger. You know, I mean, that's just, that mm -hmm. just seems to be the nature of the beast. Well, clearly, pub public safety doesn't fit that. <laughs> no. uh, right. Well, only if, you know, let's say there were burglaries <laughs> or robberies, you know, you'll, you'll see lots of people come out when it, when it affects them directly. Uh -huh. but, um, but just something like a public safety building, I, I just think that a lot of people 
had other things to do, perhaps. It's been a it's been a long, long road for the public safety building being proposed. Uh, how many 1985. Years ago? So. It's been quite some time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's never quite galvanized um, the community. There was a Blue Ribbon Commission that discussed the public safety building a while back. And, right. Um, but it's been, it feels like it's been a little bit of a tough sell. Yeah, I, th I think it's getting to be an easier sell at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mood amongst the 20 people. Uh, <laughs> and I Ten of which were city sample. staff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, when, I counted, when I counted heads, I kept the city staff out of my count. And there were, yeah, there were probably, you know, eight city staff members there or something yeah. like that. But um, so they were well represented. But I think that, uh, you know, I would have to say that, as I was saying before, the cameras are on, that it was a matter of, uh, quality, not quantity. I think that people asked a lot of very interesting questions. Mm -hmm. You had people represented from all different aspects, from from residents in this. In the, even though this is a commercial district, to um, there are still residents here, and they made a point of, of pointing that out. That you know there are actually people who live here, so mm -hmm. we're very concerned about sure. traffic issues. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, businesses that are in the area, and uh, you had. Also, um, realtors, people who you know, people who are property owners were here as well, uh, uh, were represented, and most of them came out in favor of it. So even the move, like I, I liked your um, your picture of the of it landing, you know, sort of like being picked up and transported, because it's essentially what's going to happen is that uh, nobody really said, oh gee, you know, we should keep it in downtown. Mm -hmm. There wasn't that sense. They they were welcoming of the fact that we have a police presence here and in Palo Alto's second downtown, and um, there were some people, it's interesting that because of uh, what just happened in Paris, there was a, a great deal of concern about, um, for just at least a few people, about the possibility of, of a centralized uh, public safety building being attacked. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, architects said basically we harden you know, we put hardening into these buildings. There's a considerable setback that pub, that uh, functions as a uh, public plaza, uh, and uh, there are all kinds of things that we put into it so that if somebody wants to either throw a bomb at the building, attack it with bullets, or even ram a car into it, there'll be a lot of safety uh, uh, things put in place so that that won't happen. Well, can I just say, I wouldn't read all that much to the fact that not that many people showed up. It's really hard to sustain attention in a process that's taken 20, 30 years, and we've seen that with fiber, with comp plan, with mm -hmm. concept area plans. It's like, it's been going on for so long, you have to be quality, you have to be a true believer to, to, go, to, to go to these meetings. And I'm also not, I also kind of don't exactly share the sense that this is kind of an unpopular project, because uh, in the past, when the city tried to float a bond, um, this pulled somewhere like in a just below the two-thirds threshold, which is why they didn't go forward. But but it's been like over 60 percent, or like around 60 percent of the voters mm -hmm. supported it. So it's not popular when you compare it to the libraries. But I feel like anything would be unpopular when you compare it to libraries. Well, so, and we should probably clarify yeah. that that at this point, this is going to be funded mm -hmm. not through a bond measure. Right. Um, and this so be, right, this would be funded through the hotel. What's so tax. different about where we are in this process is that the financial aspects are really now off the table. They're not. They're not the I think, subject. I think they'll come back on the table, though, once the contract costs come in, because I think they're going to be higher than initially budgeted. But yep. that's, that, that's a discussion mm -hmm. for next year. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I also, it's also worth pointing out that every council person for as all the councils I've been here for has supported it. I don't think it's yeah. been a very controversial project at all near the city leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure commission that was appointed a few years ago to study infrastructure mm -hmm. ra rates it as the number one priority. Everybody agreed on it. I think like 17, 20 something members, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They're calling it unsafe and vulnerable in this report. So, um, you know, I think it's been a pretty popular project, just not as popular as the libraries. Well, yeah. and this seems like a pretty benign location, really. Um, it's, it's not um, in a residential, it's not directly affecting a residential area. I think, Sue's your, your story uh, made clear that when the police get called for some incident, they don't all go running downstairs, hop in their police cars, and go zooming out from the police station. Right. That's not the way policing is done in Palo Alto or in any other city. So, um, and plus, the public doesn't have reason to come to the police department 
very often. Well, that so. was the other thing that was brought up. People wanted to know well, how many people are mm -hmm. basically going to be coming into this building, how many employees do you have? And they said, well, we have about 156 employees, but they're not all coming in at one time. We have like three shifts. So, and when they come in, they're not even here for very, uh, very long. The, the number of times that they have to go out with sirens blaring and, and lights flashing uh, from, from the public safety building are very few. And uh, so, and even with the, with the fire department, they may have a truck there for some reason, and if it has to take off for uh, an assignment, it, it's not usually a problem, so. Was uh, there anyone there from the apartment complexes that are in the immediate area there? And I don't yes. know if we've made clear where this is. Sure, apartment. it's bounded yeah. by Park, Sherman, and Birch. Birch, Birch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it basically. Yeah. Essentially uh, so between Kinko's and the county courthouse. Right, mm -hmm. and people were very concerned mainly with traffic along Park. That was the main. Uh, Which is already a huge a problem. concern right now. Yeah. It's a huge mm -hmm. concern. The other thing they, they were very concerned about is what happens if you're hitting sort of peak hours and you've got to go out um, to an emergency. You're not going to be able to get onto Oregon Expressway very easily. So that means you have to go through surface streets. And they said yes, but once again, they're not mostly there. They're, they're in their cars, police are in their cars, they're out in the community already, and they're sort of taking off from other points. So there were representatives there from uh, uh, the apartments nearby. Palo Alto Central. Palo Alto Central, yeah. And uh, also a resident who lives in a single, uh, a single family residence mm -hmm. as well. And they're mainly concerned about you know traffic issues and mm -hmm. speeding police cars and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't want to be forgotten in the whole mix. Mm -hmm. And they, did, yeah, oh, they did say there should be some studies done. You know, they, sh they really wanted a traffic study done. Mm -hmm. Well, an EIR, I assume, is going to be required for oh, this. Uh, so, sure. yeah. Yeah. So that would be. I think parking is also a concern uh, because um, it would be built on city-owned garages. And even though the plan calls for building a garage, and we have a, uh, a new parking garage in, next to the building, uh, Terry Shuckett from Hebel and Shuckett Photography, whose business would be pretty much next to the public safety building, um, he's opposed to the location. He's, he submitted a letter this week saying that there are many other persons opposed to it. And he's basically saying that um, the, the new garage is going to you know, replace some of the, uh, well, it'll replace all the, the spaces that would be taken from the lots and add a few more, but it's not nearly enough uh, to kind of compensate for the huge level of construction happening in this area. Mm. Well, so, well, there were, there were you know, there, I think probably parking was the biggest issue that was discussed. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not just a few parking spaces we're talking about. They're increasing by 150 parking spaces. The other thing is, is they really are not going to put up um, the public safety building until they have the replacement parking in place, because they are taking over two parking lots. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things they would do, is first basically put up the the, the parking structure on one site and then the public safety building. So that could kind of you know, they'll want to fast track the parking. One thing that came out of this is that, and I was a little bit surprised because people are kind of always concerned about the masses of large parking structures, but people said, build it, build it now, and build more of it. Build, build big. max. Build even more. If you've got three stories, you know, there, there were three different options for the parking structure, mm -hmm. one of which had all three stories um, basically with no, nothing underneath it, no ground, uh, underground parking. Mm -hmm. uh, and two others that had two levels of underground parking and were a little bit lower on the um, at level and above ground level side. But people said, we want something if you, that you can add on to if you need to. If you need to add extra floors and go up four stories, we want you to be able to do that. So, of course, there's some people that don't like that idea, and, and some of the businesses said, well, you know, parking structures are just going to be kind of pushing people away. Um, people feel intimidated by parking structures. They won't want to come here and shop because of that. Not to mention the fact that they run completely counter to the council's new philosophy of encouraging more, uh, like, transit use next to right. Caltrain Station. I mean, uh, they, they pretty much committed to building parking uh, in, in downtown Cal Avenue, new garages, back when, last year when they approved um, this infrastructure plan. So they feel like they have to kind of go along with it because they made a promise to the voters. But there's a, you hear, there's a big push from like people involved with uh, like the RPP program and the Transportation Management Authority who want to see this money being diverted to kind of Caltrain passes and other things like that, and they mm -hmm. think that building Make it... Make it so hard to park that yeah. people are forced to get there some other way. 
Yeah. But I don't think that's real. Uh, I, I personally don't think that's <laughs> the residents are realistic. Not buy that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think they're going to buy it. I think they are yeah. probably going to do something about parking because they promised. But I'd, I'd be shocked if they completely ignore this whole TDM movement and go even higher than initially has been proposed. And also, the council has been pretty um, excited about the idea of adding uh, commercial space for like uh, mom and pop stores that like, subsidize rents as part mm -hmm. of this new garage, something right. at ground level. So the idea that Go over, go break the 50-foot barrier just to have all cars mm -hmm. in kind of your second newly built downtown next to the Caltrain station. I think that would be mm -hmm. that would prove controversial at least. Well, I, th I think if if I was reading the faces of of the city officials, I didn't think that they jumped for joy at that idea. You know, they didn't seem to say, oh, oh, good, we're we've got good launch now. <laughs> yeah, they didn't <laughs> seem to do that. They seem to want to stick with the plan as is. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that they might consider, though, is um, and at least one or two merchants brought up that it, rather than having this massive building, uh, the public safety building would basically abut the, um, the stores that are right behind it uh, that are along California Avenue. They said, well, rather than having that, perhaps we could have some sort of uh, parking spaces at ground level uh, so that, you know, let's say 12, 13, whatever it is, a, a row of parking spaces for people to be able to go and park and go into the stores so that the, yeah, yeah, but that's a hazard for the public safety. Yes, building. that was brought up. Yeah, that you know, that, that just come isn't with a truck done. and a bomb and be right adjacent to it. But they are going to keep the loading areas. Mm. So, um, was there any comment on the two designs? There's a three-story and a two-story uh, design uh, option for the public safety building itself, or did the conversation just kind of stay much more at the conceptual level? I think it was much more at the conceptual level. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, that when people they cautioned a lot that when people look at the renderings that these are just these were just developed for the idea of the mass of the buildings mm -hmm. has nothing at all to do with what the architecture is going to be and mm -hmm. they said it, everything's very fluid at this point mm -hmm. so you know mm -hmm. people shouldn't like get too up the, in arms the rendering that we published has the huge north county courthouse in the yeah. foreground <laughs> yeah. and the background is this small looking building i bet you if you had flipped the orientation it would have been very different they take advantage of perspective yes they certainly do well, one of the yeah. things that they also did that that they didn't that you don't see in those renderings is they showed photographs of what you know, I mean, they did show photographs of how trees were going to be basically in front of the of the building. So you wouldn't, mm -hmm. if you're looking down the street, you wouldn't, you know, it's sort of be public safety building be hidden by the trees, yeah. basically. Yeah. At least that's thirty the, years. That's what they're selling. Interesting. <laughs> well, we need to wrap this up. Um, but let's see. The council will be talking about the public safety building coming up. Is that? Uh, yeah, I think in early December they're supposed to get a their preview. December yeah, December fourteenth, I believe. Okay. Yeah. All right. December. Great. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks for the discussion, and uh, folks, you can check us out online at paloaltoonline.com or on Twitter at Palo Alto Weekly. <laughs>